Yes, sir. Right. Sir, like. Yeah, I think just uh, we'll give it 10 seconds because there's a delay on the stream and. All right. A very good morning to everybody. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to the 16th edition of the India Digital Summit, Supercharging Startups, organized by the Internet and Mobile Association of India. The summit is supported by the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology Government of India and the Niti IO. I'm your host of the session, Yash, from IMAI, and welcome to the dialogue, I guess, uh, Future of the Internet, the Web 3.0. We would like to thank our digital financial management partner, EastBuzz, our conversational messaging partner, Gopshop, our session partner, GoQuick, Gold Partners, Manorama Online, Blink Digital, and Yellow.ai, and Silver Partners, ShareChat. Uh, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Vivek Gupta, Country Head, India R3, uh, and uh, Mr. Shailesh Lakhani, Managing Director, Sequoia Capital. So uh, over to you, Mr. Uh, Vivek Gupta. Thank you, Yash, and it's a pleasure to be at the India Digital Summit, and thank you, IMI, for inviting us. And it's a pleasure to be speaking with uh, Shailesh, uh, someone whom I respect a lot and who has uh, years of experience in with the startup space in India. So over the course of the next uh, 30 to 40 minutes, I guess, uh, Shailesh and I will uh, share our views, have an open discussion on Web 3.0. Uh, we all know it's the latest uh, buzzword. Uh, what is it all about? And we'll try and probably have a look at the different aspects of it. Uh, so before I get started, I think, Shalesh, one thing uh, just for the audience to get their baseline straight. What is Web 3.0? And maybe you can share, uh, you know, coming from Sequoia, one of the smartest investors on this planet. How do you think about Web 3.0? Uh, Vivek, thank you for, for that very warm introduction um, and e equally excited to be on, on, on this panel with, with, with you. Um, Web3 is, is perhaps the area that we, we've uh, uh, increased our relative investment in the most over the past couple of years uh, at Sequoia, both in India, Southeast Asia, as well as, as, well as around the world. Um, to step back, um, all of us use uh, many centralized internet services. Uh, whether it be search, social, video conferencing, like that we're, we're using right now, um, and, and many others, uh, where after uh, realization uh, that a lot of the, the, the trade that we did with, with these organizations was one where we gave up data in response for, for them to figure out what, what a business model was. And that, in effect, uh, was, you know, for, for many, many users feel that may, may be in an unfair trade, um, that it's something where, um, there's a lot more power in that data um, and a lot more power in the access that, that uh, these centralized entities have um, that can limit what, 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 uh, what a user could, could do. Uh, and today, some of the large centralized web companies are, are some of the most powerful organizations, government or not government, anywhere in the world. Um, web3 is, is an effort uh, to use the concepts of, of the blockchain uh, to uh, build an alternate way of, of interaction and, and building communities on, on, on the internet. Um, the blockchain, as we think about it, is, is a distributed ledger, distributed transaction, distributed computer, uh, uh, where uh, via consensus uh, uh, protocols, uh, different actors who don't necessarily trust each other can, can agree on, on what, what the truth is or, or what, what a transaction, uh, a valid transaction is. And, and using those protocols to rebuild uh, uh, many, many of the, the, the centralized services that many of us rely on uh, is, is what, what the uh, potential of Web3 is. Um, there, there's huge uh, potential uh, by, by this, and, and there's a ton of, of infrastructure and a ton of uh, work to be done to, to realize this vision, uh, but it's something that's capturing a lot of people's minds and, and, and is, is resulting in, in a lot of new company uh, or, or protocol formation uh, at this time. Um, so that's a little bit of, of what we uh, think of, 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 of Web3. Um, and, and, and via uh, in Web3, I think one of the other areas that is, is seeing a lot of potential disruption is, is the financial services industry. Uh, as, as financial services companies are amongst the largest centralized users of, uh, or, or centralized uh, like marketplaces for, 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 for uh, I wouldn't say marketplaces actually, or centralized, you know, deployers of technology or organizations that control things in, 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 in a, uh, with unilateral authority. 
Um, and, and DeFi has been, an, an, or, or decentralized finance has, has been an area that has gotten a lot of attention. Uh, there, there's been hundreds of billions of dollars that, that has that's flowed into protocols uh, and, and many people are building an alternate uh, financial system. And I know that's something that, that you work on a lot at, at R3 uh, and, and some of the challenges with, with DeFi. Uh, I, I would love your view of what, what uh, DeFi is and, and what, what some of the challenges are. Sure. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, like you rightly mentioned, uh, you know, R3, uh, we have been looking for the past seven odd years or so on how we can bring this promise of blockchain technology, now Web3, uh, to regulated financial institutions. And uh, that's where we spend most of our time. And we have also been observing DeFi, you know, just exploding out of nowhere, right? Uh, if you and I were having this conversation probably two years ago, exactly to the month, uh, DeFi didn't exist. And today it's the, the one thing that, you know, everyone's talking about. So when we look at DeFi, I think DeFi is born out of uh, certain, uh, of course, certain opportunities uh, uh, to build a new financial system by using technology and blockchain technology and the power of APIs. And it's also born to actually go around or uh, you know, circumvent some of the legacy problems that traditional financial institutions have had. And we've been doing a lot of thinking around how do we help traditional financial institutions who are rightly bound by a lot of regulations, who are rightly bound by you know, uh, reserve ratios, a KML, uh, uh, AML, KYC laws, how do we help them get into it? One of the things that we have realized is uh, that for DeFi to really scale, uh, you know, one of the key things that it needs to build with users, and I'm talking about, you know, in uh, startup terms, crossing the chasm, moving from the early adopters to the mainstream is actually build trust. Even though DeFi is uh, built around a trustless protocol, uh, for mainstream adoption, people still like dealing with financial institutions who have a long storied legacy, who have licenses, who have branches, and all of those type of things. So, how do we enable the De uh, DeFi institutions to get into uh, that space uh, and enable them from a technology as well as a process and workflow perspective to do that? Does that mean uh, we integrate with other modes of value transfer, let's say, which are authorized by the regulators, such as CBDCs? Do, do we bring decentralized identity onto the blockchain so that people can identify themselves rather than being pseudonymous? So those are some of the things that uh, we perceive as uh, one of the primary limitations of DeFi at this stage. Uh, the second thing is more on the tech side. It's tech maturity, right? Imagine today you are creating a, a trading algorithm or a trading platform on uh, DeFi. Current blockchain technologies today for probably could not support something like a high frequency trading or even the volumes of payments, for example, that NPCI does through UPI in India, right? Uh, and this is by design to a certain extent. I don't want to say that people are not working on it. Blockchains are designed to be uh, inefficient, uh, to promote you know, consensus, to promote uh, trustless trust. But if you have to drive uh, mainstream adoption, you have to figure out how will that work. And that's where we see a lot of work coming out uh, from, uh, of course, companies like ours who are doing at it in their protocols, but also in the public blockchain space, people from layer two solutions uh, who are trying to figure out how do we resolve this uh, scalability and uh, interoperability problems. The third thing to resolve is around volatility. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, most of DeFi today is based around uh, tokens or unbacked uh, synthetic tokens, uh, which have a fair amount of volatility. And we are looking at uh, options like uh, stable coins, uh, making stable coins more uh, mainstream to actually allow the Lego composability of DeFi to exist uh, without uh, customers having to deal with volatility. So I think it's still a work in progress. I think any article uh, Shalej, that you would read about uh, Web3 talks about you know, how DeFi and Web3, it's still early days yet. And some of the smartest minds in the system and some of the smartest companies in the world are working on this. 
but these are some three or four fundamental problems that you would need to solve for DeFi uh, to really go mainstream. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, the one point that I maybe would want to, uh, 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 I think that it, it's 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 work in progress is that scalability of of, of these solutions, um, the the concepts, uh, the way they were implemented, uh, wouldn't uh, wouldn't allow for scalability, but what whatever we see and whatever development uh, that we see taking place and, and perhaps one of the greatest areas of VC investment in, in, in the blockchain is how to scale uh, uh, scale solutions. Um, and we think that uh, through the course of this year, I mean, through, through things, uh, certain new blockchains that, that arrived uh, over the past 12 or 18 months, you started seeing um, some of the, the newer blockchains uh, offer scalability uh, that started to get uh, interesting for, for Web2 scale applications. And later this year, we think we'll start to see the first Ethereum-based uh, scaling solutions uh, that really achieve some sort of commercial availability um, and could start to uh, address uh, uh, some of the challenges that, that uh, you know, DeFi and, and other, other blockchain applications face uh, with respect to this. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, every single blockchain uh, startup company protocol, whatever have you, uh, is working on scalability. I think everyone understands that problem. Uh, I think it's a function of time. Uh, like you said, uh, end of the year uh, is going to be actually quite promising. Uh, Ethereum is coming out. We are doing some work in the regulated uh, blockchain space. There are, of course, other layer two solutions who are uh, figuring out how do we you know, replicate the financial system where you have something like RTGS, which handles the high value systems, and then you have, you know, the IMPS and the UPIs on top. I mean, traditional financial system is also designed as a layer one as a and a layer two system, right? So some people are approaching it from that angle. I think these things will converge uh, because there is, a, of course, there is a market demand in the financial services space, but tying it broadly to your broader definition of Web3, uh, there is a lot of potential for machine to machine commerce. There's a lot of potential for IoT enabled solutions to actually record their data on the blockchain. So all of these things are enabling forces uh, for companies to actually solve it. It's in their interest. It's not an academic exercise anymore. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, one, one of the things I, I wanted to ask you uh, maybe a little more deeper on, on, on DeFi is just the regulatory challenges. Um, that that that, uh, that exists that you foresee. Uh, we, we see certain uh, uh, regulators in, in markets like the U.S. talk much more openly about about DeFi and, and some of its its challenges. Um, but uh, where, 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 what would you say is the state of regulation today, and where, where do you see it going? So I think uh, the state of regulation today, uh, the most honest way to put it is, uh, regulators know this cannot be ignored. Uh, the exponential growth that it's seeing, uh, you really cannot ignore uh, DeFi or its derivatives, whatever uh, are upcoming in the market. Some regulators like Singapore, uh, like Fed, uh, you know, are engaging with it uh, much more proactively. But every major regulator that I know of has someone within or a team within them studying DeFi and figuring out what are the best practices that uh, they can adopt. I think what's going to happen is, uh, at least this is my view looking out, is that regulators are going to take a, a much more accommodative approach. I don't think uh, it's going to be uh, the scenario, say like in China or wherever, where they will just ban it completely. I think they will, uh, you know, coax, schedule, push uh, these organizations to actually uh, fit into some form of a regulatory framework where uh, more, couple of things can be addressed. Uh, one is identity, so that people can do KYC, AML, you know, terror financing, all of that stuff. And maybe that's another big opportunity for startups who are building solutions on that. Uh, the second thing that they would want to do is some form of traceability, which I know is kind of uh, the DeFi purists promote it as a feature, but I think for regulators, it's a bug and they will try to solve for it. And the last thing that they would try to do, especially regulators in the emerging markets, is try to figure out uh, guardrails around how uh, capital account convertibility 
uh, can be maintained with, uh, or capital controls can be maintained with yeah. in a, a DeFi world. And that's where I think there is a very interesting interplay of CBDCs and you know regulators own digital currencies interfacing with DeFi and creating something completely new, uh, which we haven't seen in the world today. Not sure. And 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 since you touched on CBDCs, what what are they? Uh, if you can define it, what what, uh, what 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 that's been something that uh, has been talked about uh, positively uh, in, in India. Uh, over recent months, as 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 it has in in, in other markets, uh, and what's the outlook for for something like that in, in in our market? Sure. So I think CBDC. I think the simplest way to define it uh, is essentially uh, digital cash, right? Uh, so if you think of money, if you're thinking of money in uh, various forms and ways, uh, at the end of the day, the two basic forms of money is cash that you are getting in your wallet from your ATM, which is essentially central bank cash. That is always going to uh, be 100 rupees as long as the government and the central bank will it to be 100 rupees. It's completely risk-free. The second is commercial bank money, which you are holding in your bank accounts and, and all of those type of things. What has happened uh, over the course of uh, last few years, and it's just accelerated over the world and definitely in India, is that this commercial bank money has been digitized to a large extent, right? Uh, and it's been digitized very, very rapidly. Uh, so today, I mean, 99.9% .9 of probably, you know, everyone's dealing with uh, digital money. But the equivalent of central bank cash still exists in physical forms. So I think CBDC is, while it's, you know, kind of lucrative to think that DeFi is driving the adoption of CBDCs or it's driving the conversation on CBDCs. And to some extent, it's true. I wouldn't want to discount that. But central banks have been thinking about digital cash because everyone wants to move uh, to a digital only environment. The cost of handling actual cash are pretty high for the economy. Right. So the moment you move to digital, the question that then uh, that comes to everyone's mind is now the only way to move digital is to have sent, uh, commercial bank money. And then commercial bank money has a set of risks associated with it. So central banks now have to offer their citizens uh, some alternate form of holding central bank money directly. And that's where we see a lot of the conversations around CBDC coming up. Uh, so one of the oldest central or in fact, the oldest central bank in the world, which is the Riksbank of Sweden, uh, started uh, from this premise. They didn't start, they started, I think, about three to four years ago, and they started from this premise rather than from DeFi. They said, hey, can I provide my citizens digital cash that is as anonymous, as easy to transact as physical cash, right? Now, once that conversation is started, then certain things start overlaying themselves, specifically if you're looking at blockchain. You digitize cash, but what if you could digitize cash using blockchain and DLT technologies? Suddenly, that opens up two very exciting uh, possibilities. One is, of course, programmability, right? Uh, money on the blockchain or tokens or digital currencies on the blockchain are programmable. Now, suddenly, policymakers start thinking, hey, uh, can this be uh, utilized to drive consumer behavior? If I'm giving, let's say, 500 rupees uh, to a poor uh, a woman in a village, right? Can I ensure that she spends it only to, you know, feed her family or for X, Y, Z set of things rather than, you know, it being spent by her husband, for example, on alcohol or something like that. I'm just giving a hypothetical example. And that, that opens up. Can I create programmable money which can only be spent in certain ways? Public spending then becomes very interesting. If I'm getting a big highway contract, can I actually ensure that the money is tracked, spent, uh, you know, in a programmable manner with traceability on the blockchain, right? And then the last piece, which is, hey, now I have made cash, digital cash available to my uh, participant or to my citizens. Can I have APIs and actually replicate the DeFi system in the traditional finance by having a Lego block like thing where you can combine APIs to create new financial products? For the for the citizens, so these are the three things. I think the primary driver is digitization, if you ask me. But programmability and this sort of 
composition of money to create new products are the ones that are driving uh, central bank digital currency conversations across the world, not just in India. Excellent. Uh, that, that's that's super helpful and and, and uh, helps explain this. But I guess one of the main aspects that a central bank uh, uh, digital currency would have uh, would would lack is decentralization. Um, as in, the central bank would have a, 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 a majority sway uh, over defining the terms and the policies around the network. Yes and no, uh, right? Uh, so, I, I mean, at R3, and this is our way of looking at things, so we kind of look at decentralization as a spectrum. Uh, so, if you have 1 to 10, uh, you know, 1 is completely centralized money and 10 is Bitcoin, right? Truly decentralized, like you literally don't need anybody. I think yeah. central bank, when you say uh, central bank, and when I look at what project central banks are doing globally, I think they fall somewhere within a five to six within a decentralization spectrum. So when you look at money, uh, there is the minting of the money, and then there is the distribution of the money and then spending of the money and all of that. Almost every major central bank that uh, I have spoken to and we have worked with uh, just wants to have control on the minting. Uh, central banks actually are very averse to uh, dealing with citizens directly. Uh, no central bank has the technological capability or the culture or whatever you call it, you know, the structure to actually have you holding an account at the central bank. Like if uh, Vivek were to go and say, I want to hold a account at Reserve Bank of India, like that's what they don't want. So what they want to hold is the minting from a macroeconomic perspective to maintain macroeconomic stability and stuff like that, which is their core mandate. But they are more than happy to have the distribution and subsequent layers be handled in a decentralized manner. And this is where I think a lot of central banks globally are co-opting the existing financial uh, institutions. So you see every major CBDC project has a commercial one or more commercial banks backing it alongside the central bank. So they are backing in the commercial banks as distribution nodes for doing stuff like KYC, ML. They are bringing in uh, payment service providers. So the you know Amazon pays, Google pays, PayPal's of the world. Uh, to actually then manage the end user wallets and stuff like that. So if you look at, if you define decentralization at the way that we define it, which is that it's a spectrum, I would say CBDCs are at least the way men, many central banks are thinking of it, quite decentralized. Great, that, that's super helpful. When, when, when do you think we might see some of these uh, actually uh, get, get implemented? So pilots are pretty un, uh, you know, underway. I think uh, China has, has uh, in many new technologies uh, leading the pack here. And I think I just read a report, in fact, yesterday evening that uh, I think they are rolling out uh, digital yuan through WeChat, I think sometime in the next couple of weeks or something like that, well in time for Winter Olympics. So I think that suddenly makes digital cash available to 1 billion people across the world. So that's a big uh, step forward. But there are, uh, you know, other uh, central bank jurisdictions. Uh, Singapore is taking the lead. Uh, there's Project Jura in France, Riggs Banken, which I spoke about. I think end of the year, early next year, you would see some really, really credible pilots uh, probably by middle of this year, to be honest. Uh, really credible pilots come up and, uh, you know, uh, drive adoption and make it more mainstream. Great, great. Uh, I just also wanted to, to, to send, uh, suggest to the audience, if there's any questions, feel free to, to ask. We, we will probably have some time for, for Q&A uh, uh, to, towards the end of this panel. So, Sh Shalish, I wanted to circle back because you defined Web3 uh, pretty concisely. So, uh, you know, let's broaden our lens from finance and uh, digital currencies to Web3 in general. Where do you think uh, this is going? A, I think two parts to my question. A, what do you see is the steady state? And feel free to choose a time horizon for the steady state. What is the steady state? And uh, B, what sectors do you think will thrive in that steady state? Yeah. So I think that there's a, there's a bunch of different aspects uh, to this. Um, one being that uh, the infrastructure is not ready. Um, 
that uh, the technology of, of, of blockchain is, 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 uh, is still being built. Uh, we, we think in the next one, two, three, five years, it will keep getting better and better. Um, and a lot of the concepts that people are talking about uh, could become reality. Um, number two uh, is that the, uh, the use cases of this uh, are still being discovered. Uh, NFTs, uh, non-fungible tokens, or, or digital asset ownership, which could be verified uh, and, and validated on, on a blockchain, is a relatively new concept that didn't really reach mainstream uh, awareness, even in crypto circles, uh, up until the last 12 or 18 months. Um, and similar to that, even the concept of, of, of Bitcoin, uh, the, the granddaddy that, that started everything here, um, has, has changed. Uh, the original Satoshi white paper uh, indicates it as a payment system uh, and, and talks about how uh, centralized uh, actors like Visa, MasterCard take uh, a, a, an, an unfair share of, of transaction uh, costs. Um, whereas Bitcoin has been actually a pretty terrible payment system uh, and, and today has largely evolved into a store of value. Um, and if you were to use it for payments, the, the transaction costs or the gas fees on, on, on networks are or uh, make it far inferior to uh, um, you know, centralized approaches. Um, so what I'm trying to say is that the applications and the utility of, of, of this uh, are still being understood. Uh, I, I think uh, everyone understands that it is very interesting technology. Um, it has uh, the ability potentially when, when, when it scales to, to displace uh, very large services that we use today. Um, but I think we'll see some more zigging and zagging uh, of, of things that uh, find uh, an actual use case different than what, what uh, it was originally uh, uh, intended for um, and, and stuff that gets repurposed or, or becomes possible um, uh, with, when, when scalability uh, kicks in. Um, I think that there are also lots of people building things that probably are bad applications for, for blockchain. Um, that, uh, uh, for an internal uh, enterprise application uh, where you can probably trust all your employees uh, or you can uh, probably uh, have some view of what your suppliers or, or your customers' motivations are. Uh, that type of system probably never needs to be built on, on, on a blockchain. Um, and the, the, the compute costs or the data storage costs uh, for building on a blockchain would make it un unviable. Um, so, the way we, we see it is that, um, to summarize it, you know, things, the, the infrastructure will let us build things that we are, are, uh, maybe could only imagine uh, earlier and they couldn't be created in, in, in reality. Um, and it'll probably enable new types of applications uh, that are, are, are still, uh, you know, uh, just today just not possible. Um, and they have a potential to displace uh, a lot of the core uh, you know, internet services, consumer internet services that, that many of us rely on. Um, steady state, uh, I don't think will exist uh, uh, until anything close to the later part of, of, of this decade. Um, that um, there'll be a lot of, uh, uh, of key events that, that, that exist. Um, so one of the, the main macro events that we're, we're, we're awaiting is what happens when, uh, when, when the Fed reduces uh, yeah, Fed, Fed increases interest rates and overall interest uh, in, in this category. Uh, so certainly, you know, blockchain or, or Bitcoin or, or crypto is a bit reflexive. That uh, the, the more money available, the more interest there is, the, the more gets built. Um, and uh, you know, is, is there as much interest to keep keep the pace of development that, that we've seen? Second, like things like Bitcoin that uh, are still inflationary today. Uh, at a certain point in the time, in, in the next 10, 20 years, will we'll not become inflationary anymore, and they'll be rely on transaction costs. And will that be enough to, to keep these networks uh, incentivized and, and, and going? Um, similarly, like, will the scaling solutions that people are proposing on, on, on blockchains uh, actually work, or will there need to be you know, drastic other solutions? So overall, steady state, we think, is just a, a long time away. Uh, and there'll be lots of, 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 of uh, uh, interesting things that come along um, and, and probably create a lot of value um, in, in between, between now and that. Um, the, the other aspect of this, um, 
as unlike pieces of new technology, um, other pieces of new technology, let's say cloud computing, uh, for example, um, that consumers have gotten very involved in this financially uh, already. Uh, there are hundreds of millions of users uh, around the world who actually own cryptocurrencies. Um, and the, the way to, to onboard someone uh, is today is largely a, a game of speculation. Of, 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 of trading and of, 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 of investing to, 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 to make money. Um, but eventually that could be a way of, of you know, getting your first users from, from selling a, a token uh, to, to them. Um, and it, it's changing from, uh, uh, it's changing the, the way that we, 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 we view our relationship with our, with our users. Uh, as, a, as a Web2 company, you're, you're a user, you're a customer. Uh, here you're a participant, uh, you, you are a, a co-owner. You have some uh, potentially some some uh, um, ability to influence what the direction of, of, of the project of, of, of that service is, um, and th there's lots of you know interesting, sometimes dangerous, uh, sometimes uh, sh short lifespan financial incentives that, that are underpinning a, a lot of this, uh, and what, when when those run out, what, which they you know by by what's written in the smart contract will eventually run out. Uh, well, how will this play out, and how will people be excited to keep using this? I mean, I mean you, you talked a little bit about DeFi, but De DeFi, I think, one of the main reasons that people use it is often the incentives that, that come along with, uh, with, with with many of these projects in, in, in the early build-out phase. Um, so yeah, that, that was a long-winded uh, way of saying that I think we're super early. It, it's super interesting, um, but uh, it's hard to say exactly what what uh, what it will impact. Great. So one follow-up question, and I see we have three pretty good questions here, so we should get to that. But one quest, quick question that I wanted to ask you, do you think this will be like Web 2, which will create new giants? Or do you think this will be, there's a new paradigm where some of the existing uh, Web 2 companies will make a strong transition, or some maybe even traditional companies will make a strong transition into, into this Web 3 world? We we are, are are quite optimistic of Web two and Web three uh, merging. Um, that uh, there's lots of good aspects of, of Web two that, that exist. There's lots of users on it already. Um, th there's many things they've figured out in terms of usability uh, and, and speed and performance. Um, and there's many aspects of services that you probably don't need decentralization for. Um, and, and there's a middle ground that uh, that might make more sense. Uh, for for actual implementation of, of, of things. Um, so one of the efforts we're working a lot with our portfolio companies on is is just understanding Web3 and, and what the core concepts are and encouraging them to think about how it could apply to, to their business. Um, that, uh, 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 like we, we think, for example, um, that one of the, the most likely applications for DeFi, uh, and, and I see one of the questions that will come up is, is around credit. Um, and, and maybe we'll, 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 we'll use this as a chance to answer that. And the, the question just to, to, to reiterate to everyone is, what would the impact on DeFi be on access to credit, particularly in areas where credit has been difficult to access? Um, would be that you know, DeFi is another set of rails uh, that lets money move from one place to the other um, with programmable uh, uh, security and uh, you know, verifiable security uh, and and control of, of, of that money. Um, so what you could do, let, let's say you're a small business in India uh, and, and you're looking for, for credit, um, that uh, a traditional financial services company or a fintech company could be the front end who, who manages the last mile connectivity with, with the actual borrower. Uh, but they borrow from uh, global DeFi lenders um, who uh, maybe looking for, for a different rate of return um, than, than uh, uh, what is available for by the, the current fintech or uh, company or, or, or financial services company. And that fintech financial services company is bound by the terms of the smart contract on, on, on DeFi on how to utilize that money. Uh, but they also do the, the physical labor of, of collections and, and sourcing and, and enforcement of, of, of the property rights that might exist with, with that loan. Um, and so we, we, we see that as a way of, of you know, Web 2, Web 3 melding, uh, that there, there's benefits of, of, of Web 3 
uh, there, there's enforceability in, in, in the digital world. But Web2 companies or, or you know, offline companies still need some, some muscle uh, in order to, to, to hassle someone to, to actually pay up a loan when, when, when they're not paying. Um, and so we, we see all this world you know, potentially leveraging this new technology and, and maybe not completely new giants uh, being formed out of it. Excellent. That's a very interesting uh, perspective, Shilesh. Thank you for that. I, I'll take the next one. Uh, uh, someone has asked, do you expect Web3 technologies being integrated into public sector services, such as putting housing deeds on the blockchain or using blockchain for elections? So yes, but a caveat, please don't use blockchain for elections. It's a terrible idea. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the caveat here is, uh, you know, the the thing here is that uh, the uh, ecosystem needs to be brought in, right? The issue is not putting the deeds on the blockchain. Like that's, in fact, if you look at technologists like us, we'll say that's a trivial problem. You tell me, I'll take the doc, scan it, create a hash, put it on the blockchain. But if the input that's going into this ecosystem is garbage, blockchain cannot solve the fact that we are not detecting that there are three claims to a piece of land or four claims to a piece of land. And that resolution of whose claim is legitimate, for example, still has to happen in the real world, right? Blockchain cannot help you solve that. Once you have resolved that and you have put that data on the blockchain, it can track how, uh, you know, the, uh, the deed moves, how it transfers and who all are the people impacted. Maybe if it's, let's say, a deed held by a trust, you can programmatically define who gets paid, how much if the piece of land is sold and all of that. But the challenge here is not putting that stuff on blockchain, but it is bringing the ecosystem together to ensure that the correct stuff is put on the blockchain. And then it can be business as usual or the efficiencies can be derived uh, subsequent to that. I don't know, Shalesh, if you have anything to add on that. Yeah, I, I agree uh, with, with what you're saying. Um, that um, blockchain is, is an interesting way uh, of validating that the land record or or a vote uh, is something that uh, um, it hasn't been tampered by one single party. Um, but uh, the ch choosing the validators or choosing the other people who are there to uh, to validate that transaction was correct is another tricky aspect of this. Like who are the five, ten, hundred thousand people that should be there along with the government or the election commission or the local real estate regulator uh, to co-validate that transaction? Um, and how, how are they chosen? What's the consensus mechanism that, that they should use? What is the relative power? How do you resolve disputes and, 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 and uh, um, er errors that, that, that might occur? Uh, these are tricky aspects uh, in, 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 in these public sector um, um, implementations of, of, of blockchain. But uh, there probably will be someone who figures this out. Yeah, and there, there's a lot of work to be done in that space, and uh, that could be a big startup by itself. I think the last one, uh, Shalesh, you question that we have here, uh, I think you referred to it, and I think it's a follow on to that. Can you please elaborate on how Bitcoin today is different from what was imagined in Satoshi's white paper? So do you want yeah, to spend some Sure, time? sure. I, I haven't read the white paper in, in some time, um, but uh, I believe the title was a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system is what how Bitcoin was described. Um, and in terms of being a cash system, uh, I, I think it's a pretty terrible cash system. Um, as, an, as a method for, for payments, um, it, it is uh, super expensive. Uh, it, it is very slow. The number of transactions per second um, that, that it supports are, 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 are not, not, uh, not, uh, not very high. Um, also, it, it's very volatile. Um, and so, you know, uh, buying or, or, or spending on something that, that has turned out to be as volatile um, is, is something that you know, most people wouldn't, wouldn't feel comfortable doing. Um, I, I also believe a, a bunch of the white paper talked about commerce uh, as being something that, that uh, Bitcoin would, would enable or, or, or uh, be part of. Uh, but uh, that's not been, been actually the, the way that, that uh, it's been implemented. Yep. And I think one technical point that I wanted to mention was uh, 
it's uh, Bitcoin doesn't uh, give you deterministic finality. So it's sorry, Shalesh, are you saying something? Or you're on mute? No, sorry, sorry. Okay. Uh, so it it basically uh, the transactions on Bitcoin are uh, final uh, by probability. So once six blocks are mined, uh, you would say that okay, ninety nine point nine 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 percent my transaction is final, but Potentially, there could be a seventh block, which could, with that small probability, revert your transactions. Now, in the real world, uh, whether it's low value transaction, whether it's high value transaction, this probabilistic finality just doesn't work. Like your Chaiwala is not going to take 10.001 Bitcoin and give you a T and three hours later, he realizes, oh, that transaction was not valid. And definitely for bigger uh, values, it doesn't hold at all. So I think that's where it's moved from being a store of value, uh, sorry, from a payment method to a store of value and effectively an on-ramp for a lot of DeFi stuff. Great. Uh, I, I see we have Yash back. Uh, yes. Uh, Yash, are we out of time or, 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 or should yeah, we I'm come afraid, I'm afraid I think we're out of time. <clears throat> so right. th th I thank just you, wanted yeah, this was a fun conversation. Uh, really interesting to hear your views on 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 a wide range of topics. I uh, hope we can connect again soon. Absolutely, it's always fun to chat with you, Shalesh. Take care, and thank you, Yash, for inviting us. Thanks to Anne. So, thank you so much for the talk, guys. I think we all got to learn a lot, and a big thank you also to our attendees who made this possible. Uh, so, we'll see you guys in the next session, and uh, thank you so much, guys, once again. Stay safe.